Make sure you are wearing your mask and that you can see space next to you, spread out. Ladies in the back row, you need to spread out. Make sure you can see space next to you. Ladies in the back, keep going. You need to see an empty seat next to you. Good morning, everyone. Will you stand and sing with us?
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all here today, God, and just for once again giving us this opportunity to still meet together, God, to be in person, to have a chapel and just have the chance to worship you, God, and just keep us all safe and healthy as we go through this next semester and give us all ears to listen to the teaching and give us a great rest of the day. In your name I pray, amen. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes? All right. Um, I'm going to open up a quick word of prayer because we can't ever pray enough, and then we'll get started. Yep. Just in case. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for um, bringing us here. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are a, a great and a loving God, and God, that you, um, God, consider us worthy. God, worthy of sending your son to die for us. Worthy of, um, God, worshiping you. Uh, God, you, you don't need us, but we need you, God. And I pray that as we, as we look at your word today, God, that we would realize that more and more is our need for you and our need for a Savior. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Mr. Reed. I'm one of the deans here. I also teach some of the eighth graders. I know some of you a lot better than the others, some from class, some not from class, unfortunately. Um, but... I'm really excited to get to talk to you guys today. I'm thankful for Dr. Taylor for the opportunity to do that. Um, we're going to continue our, our work through Acts today. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 14 and 15. If you have a Bible, you could turn there and kind of follow along because we will be reading some, some chunks of scripture today. Um, I was joking with Coach Arnold actually before we got started. And I said, man, I could actually probably spend the rest of the semester on Acts 14 and 15 if I had the opportunity to because there's so much to unpack here. Um, but we're going to jump through some stuff and kind of look at some of the key points. Um, and what I really want to talk about today, and, and kind of the key of our talk, will be about the law and the gospel, and how those two things go together, okay? Um, because there's something really big that happens in Acts chapter 15 um, that Paul, Barnabas, and Peter are working through with, with some of the Pharisees. And so that's going to be our main point. But I also don't want to skip over what happens in Acts 14. So we're going we're gonna to start there. Uh, we're going to cover what happens in Acts chapter 14, and then uh, get rolling from there. So if you have your Bible, you, or if not, you can kind of read what we're going to cover, some of the main points up there. And so Acts chapter 14 is just, again, chronicling what Paul and Barnabas are doing on the road. They're traveling all over the place, preaching the gospel, spreading the word, uh, going to churches, encouraging them, uh, and also having a lot of hardships along the way. They're, they're, they're being challenged, they're being persecuted for their faith, and we'll, we'll see that here in a second. Um, but so in, in chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Ly Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. And so we see, again, we see this, we see this theme of Paul and Barnabas going to cities, preaching the gospel, and there being a division. Right? There's a division between the Jewish people, the Gentiles, and then between the apostles that are preaching this gospel. And there's, this, there's this struggle. And we saw that, we see that in verse 4. It says, the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And so what, what were they disagreeing on? And we're going to get to that a little bit more in a second here. Um, and so we see that they were threatened, right? Paul and Barnabas were threatened. It says they were threatened with their lives. And so what do they do? They, they travel and so they, they go on to not a whole lot better situation. And so they travel from um, Iconium to Lystra. And so they go to Lystra, and then we're going to jump down to verse 8, and it says, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, like, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And so this, this crippled man, Paul heals this crippled man. He says, stand up and walk. And then these people in, in Lystra, they go and say, wow, the gods, the gods have made this person well through these men. 
And they, they go on to say that they think that Barnabas is, is one of their gods, Zeus, and that Paul is one of their gods, um, who is it? Her, Hermes. And so they, they have these idea of, man, these guys are, are one of our gods that we worship. They were worshiping, doing pagan worship and practicing pagan worship. And Paul corrects them, and Paul says, Men, why are you doing these things? In verse 15, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. And so Paul says, listen, it's not Zeus or Hermes or whoever doing this, it's, it's the one true living God. He says he's given you, whether you've worshipped him or not, he's given you rain every season, he's given you food, he's provided for you, he's given you common graces every single day. That's who you need to be worshipping. It's getting a lot. Hope I'm quieter. Um, but so, we see, again, we see this struggle between the two, okay? So we, we continue to see this tension building, we continue to see uh, all of this happening. And so, we see then in verses... Um, he says in verse 15 through 18, he says that, and then we jump down to verse 19. It says, But Jews from Antioch and Iconium, having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. Okay, I'm going to stop there for just a second. So, what Paul was saying was so divisive that they chose to stone him, right? Literally, and, and Dr. Taylor's talked about this before, literally taking stones and hurling it at him until he dies. And they, they believe they did that, right? You can read on in verse, verse 19, it says, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead, right? They stoned Paul so brutally, right? They thought he was dead, so they, they dragged him out of the city. They didn't want a dead body in their city. They dragged him out of the city and leave him for dead. But what does the very next verse say, right? It says, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. okay? So, again, Paul, amazing, amazing guy, right? get stoned to the point of people thinking he was dead, right? Imagine the pain. That the, I mean, I've, I've been through workouts where I felt like I couldn't get up the next day and do anything, let alone getting stoned to the point of people thinking he was dead, and then I'm going to get up the next day and travel. And again, it's not like he can just call an Uber and travel to Derby, right? He has to walk by foot or ride on a horse, do something that's not a very comfortable way of travel. He doesn't have his phone to, to play games on during his travel. It's a, it's a long journey. It's a taxing journey, and he does it the day after he is stoned, right? And so that's, that's, the, that's the importance Paul has for the, for the mission that he's trying to accomplish, right? He's, he sees such value in the mission he's trying to accomplish, and he understands that there's going to be people that are going to oppose that. Uh, and so again, we see this tension, we see this divisiveness um, between Paul and between some of the Jewish people. And then we see that they, they travel into Antioch, um, and that's where they kind of end up, and that's where we jump into Acts 15. And so at the end of chapter 4, uh, it says, and they, when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. Okay, so they're, they're in Antioch, they're spending time with the disciples. Again, they're preaching, they're teaching, all those things, they're, they're performing miracles, doing all of these great things, all right? And then Acts chapter 15 happens, okay? So, so this is where we're going to spend most of our time, is Acts 15, kind of 1 through, one through 11, okay? Um, so, when they arrived there, it says in verse 1 in chapter 15, some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay? So, what this guy is basically saying, and so people are coming down, and, and they're basically saying, unless you're circumcised. So, circumcision was an Old Testament piece that, that was mean, meant you were a part of the Jewish covenant. It meant you were, were in God's circle, so to speak. Okay? Um, and so, what that basically says is that you can't be saved unless you perform some work, all right? You can't, you can't be in right standing with God unless there's something that you do, okay? And so that, that's what this guy is saying. That's, that's what he is challenging Paul and Barnabas and the apostles with is, listen, you're saving all of these Gentiles. They're, they're claiming to be Christians, claiming to be believers, but they haven't been circumcised. They're, they're, they're not doing what you're supposed to do in order to be saved, okay? And so that, that's what he's challenging them with. And so you see, it says, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. So, like, listen, this, this went on for some time. They're going back and forth. They're debating. They're, they're bringing in people. They're, they're, you know, almost to the point of argument. They are 
trying to convince each other of, hey, this is this to be, this is the way we think it has always been, so it should stay that way, right? And so they're, they're going back and forth constantly. And so after all that debate, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So they're like, listen, stop. We're going to take you to the big dogs in Jerusalem, and we're going we're gonna to settle this matter, right? So we're, we're going to take people that really know these things, so we're going to take you to Jerusalem, and we're, we're going to settle this once and for all, okay? So they travel to Jerusalem. So it says in verse 3, so being sent out on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. And then when they came to Jerusalem, so they're in Jerusalem now, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Again, verse 5, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necess- necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Okay? And so again, there's these people, the Pharisees. Again, Pharisees are the rule followers. They're the ones that say, you have to do this, 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 and this. There's this big, long list of things you have to do in order to be right with God. Okay? And so that's what these people are saying, that, yeah, these people are Gentiles, and they might, they might faith, but they aren't keeping the rules that we're keeping, so there's no way they can be the same as me because they're not keeping the rules that I'm keeping. And so that's what these people are challenging Paul and Barnabas with, and they go into this, this big, long discussion, but I want to pause there and talk about that for a second, okay? Because the Pharisees are calling for something that's not focused on what the gospel is focused on, all right? And we have, we have the beauty of, of being able to look at this, you know, 2,000 plus years after the fact and be able to look at it with knowing all of Scripture and knowing the entirety of, of who God is to, to an extent, right? We don't know all of who God is, but we, ha- we have Scripture to help us there, right? But these Pharisees are calling for something that today we might call something like moralism. And so moralism is basically, if, I'm, if I do enough good works, I will be right with God. I will be okay in God's eyes, okay? And so that's what these Pharisees are calling for is, listen, they might proclaim these things, but, but they're, not, they're not doing everything that they're supposed to do, right? And that, that's how, as a Pharisee, that's how they thought they were right with God. Man, I keep all these rules. I do everything I'm supposed to do on the Sabbath. I wash my hands right. I eat the right food. I say all the right prayers, all of those things. And that's what they thought made them right with God. However, moralism is not the thing that saves us, right? Our works are not what save us. And so the Pharisees were trying to water down the message of the gospel into simple moralism. And so what is the gospel is, is a good question. But let's start again. Let's start with just what is moralism. And I, I'm, let me just tell you right off the bat, moralism is one of the biggest things, especially in our environment, in the South, in a Christian school. Um, moralism is one of the biggest tools that Satan uses to deceive us into thinking that we're okay. It is. I, I'm, I'm just telling you, I, I, I've talked to numerous people, that, that it's one of the biggest things that Satan uses to make us think that we're okay with God, is that we base it on ourselves. Okay? So, moralism. I, I kind of have two, two definitions for it, and two things that, that we need to make sure we understand about moralism. And number one is that I can be good enough to find favor in God's eyes and earn my salvation. Okay? That's one lie that moralism tells us. All right? And we may never come out and say that, but that, at the root of it, that's what moralism is, is. I can be good enough. I can do enough good things to make myself right with God. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is that my standing with God is dependent on my behavior and my ability to please him. Okay? So that's the second thing moralism shows us. And that's the second thing those Pharisees are basically saying is that, listen, in order to please God, we have to do a bunch of good things. Okay? In, or, in order to make him happy with us, we have to do enough good things. All right? And so, those are kind of the two things. And, and, and listen, that's a tool that Satan is using. That's false. That's a false gospel. That's not something that the Bible teaches. That's not what Scripture teaches us. Okay? And so, what does, what does Scripture teach us? How do, how do we know who we are? How do we know how we are right with God, because that, again, that's what all of Scripture points to, is how we are to be in relationship with God, how we're to be in right relationship with God, right? And so, from the start, and so we're going we're gonna to back up there and figure out, okay, well, where is that, where is that divide? Why can't I be good enough 
to be right with God, right? That might be a question you're asking yourself, might be a question you've thought about is, why can't I be good enough? I'm a pretty good person. I do a lot of good things. I don't, I don't kill anybody. I don't lie too much. I'm pretty obedient to my parents, right? Um, I, I'm pretty honest with my, my schoolwork. I don't cheat a whole lot. Maybe I don't cheat at all, whatever, right? And so where, where is that divide? Where is that line that says, okay, on this side, I'm okay with God. On this side, I'm not, okay? So let, let's talk about that for a second. And so from the very beginning, all right, and we see, we're going to look at four different quick verses here. We see that from the beginning, when we are born, we are born into sin, right? Sin is what separates us from God, right? Sin, the, the Greek word for sin literally means missing the mark. And so when we sin, God has a standard, right? What's God's standard? Anybody know? What's God's standard for our lives if we're to be right with him by ourselves? Anybody? Bueller? Perfection. Okay, if you didn't know that. Perfection. God demands perfection of us if we're, if we're to be right with him on our own. Be holy as I am holy. That's what he tells us. Right? And so we are, if, if we're on ourselves, we have to be perfect. And scripture tells us we're already kind of at a disadvantage before we're even born. Psalm 51.5 tells us, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So from the moment we're in our mom's womb, in our mom's stomach, we're born into sin, right? That's why we just celebrated Christmas a little bit ago. That's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin, so that he wasn't born into sin, okay? So from the beginning, we're at a disadvantage there, relying on ourselves, from, from the beginning. Romans 3, 10 through 12, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks after God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good not even one, right? If you want to really feel really, really good about yourself, go read the first three chapters of Romans. Paul, Paul does a great job of lifting your spirits there. Um, and I'm being sarcastic. He, 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 he paints a picture of us that, that is harsh and, and, and hard to deal with, but it's true, okay? And he kind of sums it up there in Romans uh, 3, 10 through 12, and then he finishes right before he makes his turn in, in verse 24 in chapter 3. He says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so we all fall short of that mark, okay? And then and in Ephesians 2, 1 through 2, one, one last one says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, right? And so from those four verses, we can see, right? Scripture's pretty clear. We cannot be good enough on our own, right? We cannot be, we can't keep all these rules, these laws, these things that God expects us to and get with him. And so one, one question I've always had, and I, I struggled with at your age, I struggled with as a new believer is, well, why does God give us rules then? Why does God give us the law? Right? We think, of, I, when, I, when I'm saying the law, I should preface this, I'm talking about, you know, basic is the Ten Commandments, right? There's a lot more that goes into that, but we can basically say the Ten Commandments, right? And so that's, that's God's moral law, how we are to live. Um, and in that moral law, why, why would God give us those rules if he knows we can't keep them? By ourselves, he knows we can't keep them, so why would he give them to us? Okay, and so, before we're Christians, the main reason that he gives them to us is so that we know we're not good enough, all right? And so, the law shows us that there's this gap, right? And so, I'm in a gym, I would have really regretted not using a basketball analogy because it's probably the only time I'll ever preach in a gym. So, I'm going to use a basketball analogy, right? And so, anybody in here can dunk yet? No, probably not any middle schoolers can dunk yet one or two, okay? Back when I was in shape, I could dunk, okay? So what God's standard says, all right? God's standard says, hey, if you can, well, our standard might say, well, if I can dunk, that makes me a pretty good basketball player, right? I'm athletic. I can do all of that, okay? So let's relate that to the law. If I can dunk, that means I can keep some of the laws, right? Well, now my sin has separated me from, from God. So now, now I have to j jump from the free throw line and dunk, Right, now I have to jump from here and try to dunk. Well, now I've sinned more, so there's, there's, this, there's a bigger gap. Now I have to jump from the free throw line. Right, well, no, I've, I've sinned even more. So now, now I have to try to jump from half court. I have to be able to jump from here and dunk the basketball. Well, no, there, there's, and we, we, can keep, we can keep going back and back as far as we want, right? But what sin does is it puts a gap between us and God, right? I'm, I, I could stand here till I'm dead, and I could try to jump from here and dunk, and it's never going to happen, right? 
I physically, no one physically can, can do that. Okay? And that's what, that's what sin does to our relationship with God. It puts a gap between us that we can't fill on our own. Okay? It, put, it puts this, this chasm, right? And, and probably, honestly, a, the best analogy for that is the Grand Canyon, right? It'd be, our, our sin literally separates us as far as the Grand Canyon, and, and again, more, moreover, and we'd have to jump over the Grand Canyon and try to dunk a basketball. That's what our, that's what our sin does, okay? But what moralism teaches us is, well, I'm really supposed to be able to jump from here, but I, I follow the rules, so maybe it's here. And then, well, I'm, I'm nice to my friends, and I stand up for them, so maybe it's here. But no, I can't, I can't still quite get there, so maybe it's, maybe it's here. But no, I, I obey my parents most of the time, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm good most of the time, and I go to church, so maybe I just have to dunk it. Well, I, I can't quite dunk it yet, so maybe it's just make a layup, right? And so maybe it's just, okay, now, now I'm right with God. And so, thank you. That took a lot of skill. But so, so what that shows, okay, what that shows is as in our sin nature, in our pride, we're going to try to keep justifying and narrowing that gap so that we can say, yeah, I am good enough to be right with God, right? I can, I can do enough good things on my own to be good enough because there's people that do far worse, right? We, we can always think and we always like to compare. Man, there, there's kids in my class that, that cheat and I don't. There's kids in my neighborhood that, you know, yell at their parents and I don't. You know, you get down the line, there's people that are bad at their jobs or dishonest in their jobs, and I'm not. We can always justify what we're doing if we're relying on ourselves. Okay? So, I know it's been a pretty discouraging message so far, but there's hope. Okay? So there's hope. So, so we, have this, we have this chasm that we have to jump, right? We have this gap. And that's, again, that, that's going back to Acts. That's what the Pharisees are saying is, Listen, we have to try to jump that gap by ourselves. They need, they need to be ordered, Paul. They should be ordered to have to keep the law of Moses in order to be right with God. They have to or, or, or they, can't be, they can't be one of us. But then, and Peter kind of just makes an appearance out of nowhere here, um, as Peter likes to do. He likes to, to interject. And Peter, and, and we, we see in verse 8, we see it says, and God, oh, hold on. No, verse 7, so we'll start there. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting the disciples... Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And so, so Peter interjects, and, and Peter shares the true gospel with them. Okay? And so what Peter says is, listen. Yes, there's a chasm between us. Yes, there, there is a law that we're supposed to keep. We can see none, none of our forefathers have kept it. We haven't kept it. So why would you ask them to keep it? And, and Peter goes on to say, he says, listen, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. He said, listen, brothers, you guys are, you guys are asking them to do something that you yourselves know you can't do. Right? And so he's telling them, listen, Christ is the way over sin. Christ is the way to be perfect enough. Right? Again, go back to this analogy, right? I'm, I'm jumping from here to try to dunk. I can't do it on my own. Right? But how do I then do that? How, how do I fill that chasm? Right? And that's the Sunday school answer, which is what, everybody? Jesus. Right? That's the one time it's, you know, it's usually always, right? But that's, that's the time it's right, is our, our answer to that is, is Christ, right? When Jesus came to earth, again, we just talked about he was, he was born perfect. He was born without sin. He lived a perfect life, something we can't do, something we haven't done, right? He lived a perfect life. He died a death when he was perfect because, right, and this is, 
I still struggle with this to, to understand and grasp the fullness of the thing that Christ did on the cross. But right? Christ was perfect. He was the only one that when he died, he could stand before God and say, yep, I deserve, I deserve to step into the kingdom because I, I did everything that I was supposed to. I kept the law exactly how you told me to. So I can, I can step in. I can jump from half court and dunk the ball. Right? Jesus is the only one ever that's been able to say that. But instead, he said, no, I'm not going to step in. I'm going to take the weight of all of the sins of the world on my shoulders, and I'll take their penalty. I'll take their punishment so that they can believe and they can be in right relationship with me. And so that's what Christ did. That's the beauty of what Christ did on the cross for us is that he took that punishment. He took that burden. He took that chasm and he built a bridge, right? He, he, built, a, he built a way for us to just walk there if we, if we believe in the gospel. We put our faith in Christ, Right? And so, so how, how like to, to kind of finish with this, how are we to respond to that? Or how are we to think about that? And there's two different categories that no matter when you're speaking, you're speaking to one of these two categories. The first one is you're speaking to people that are not yet Christian, okay? In a, in a room this size, there are some that are not yet Christians, and that's okay. You know, that, that's, there's, there's nothing wrong there at all. And so my challenge to you and my question for you to, to you to consider as we finish is, Number one, who are you relying on? Are you relying on your own works? Are you relying on your goodness? Um, do you think you're right with God and you still rely on yourself? Where are you at and how, what are you relying on in your day-to-day -day life? Okay, are you believing a lie? Again, it's, it's a lie that Satan uses. Are you believing the lie that you can be good enough, you can rely on yourself and be right with God? Are you believing that lie? And again, you have a God that loves you in spite of your pride, in spite of my pride of thinking, man, I was 100% I was this person. I'm speaking to myself more than anybody. I was 100% this person when I was your age in middle school. Man, I, I played the part. My teachers thought I was perfect. My parents thought I did everything right behind closed doors, behind, behind their backs. I was, I was the one throwing paper. I was the one hitting my friends. I was the one saying me. That was me in middle school because of my pride and my moralism, I thought, man, I can just put on the appearance and God will approve of me and my teachers and my parents will approve of me because that's all they see, right? But God, God sees everything, right? We know that. All He knows all. And so in spite of that, of the fact that God knows our thoughts, our actions, right? He loves us anyways. Right? He, he loves us enough to have sent his son, again, like we just talked about, to die on a cross for us. Right? And again, and, and maybe, you're, maybe you're kind of the other side. Maybe you think, well, I don't really care about being good enough. I've done whatever I've wanted. And that, that gap now seems way too far. Right? That, that chasm I have to jump over, that line I have to jump from behind to dunk the ball, way too far. Right? It's out at the football field. And I feel like I can never get there. You are never too far and never too dark for the forgiveness of God. Please, please hear that, is that no matter what, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, you are never too far gone to be by our Savior, right? Um, and so as a non-believer, I, I urge you and I, I encourage you, the, the Bible teaches, Christ teaches, Repent of your sins and believe in the gospel. Repent of your sins and, and put your faith in Christ who has taken that punishment for you. Okay? Now, the second, the second group is, is those who are Christians in here. Those who are Christians, those who have put their faith in Christ, hopefully you've realized that, yeah, I'm not good enough, so I do need Jesus, and I do need him to help me get through the day and help me get to where I want to be. So how does that, how does this still isn't a one-time thing and okay I, I know that he did it now I can again keep relying on myself to live each and every day right no the reason God gave us the law before salvation is to show us that we need Christ the reason God gave us the law after we are saved is so that he gives us the freedom to live how he has called us to live 
That's one of the, again, another, another huge misconception about Christianity is that once I'm a Christian, it's just a bunch of rule following. I can't do this, I can do this. I can't do that, I can do that. No, what true salvation does is it frees us up. It gives us the freedom to live the way God has called us to live. And when you can trust in that, when you can trust and understand that, hey, God has saved me, God, has the, God is the one that has rescued me from my darkness, man, I have the freedom now to live the way he has lived, and I find joy in that. I find peace in that. I find comfort in that, that, that those, those rules that looked like rules before now look like beautiful guidelines that God has given me in order to live. And so as a Christian, be encouraged that, hey, we no longer are burdened by the law, but now we have the, the beautiful responsibility of keeping the law, not to, not to be saved, but to honor him more and more with our actions each and every day. And so where are you on that journey? Okay, so that, that, that's what I want to leave you today is, is where, are, where are you on that journey and have you put your faith in Christ? Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for who you are. Um, God, I pray that we would just consider our own hearts and see who are we relying on each and every day, um, God, to, to be in right relationship with you. And God, I pray that, that each person in this room would, would put their faith in Christ, that they would believe on you, um, God, that they would trust in you more and more each and every day. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed.